so we'll go ahead and get started. To those on the West Coast, good morning and thank you for joining us, and to those on the East Coast, good afternoon and happy Friday to all. Um, before we get started here today, I just wanted to cover a couple housekeeping items with the group. Uh, Chris, if you can get an advance the slide. Uh, should there be questions on today's call, due to the size of the call, we have roughly 40 people on the line right now. Uh, all lines will be muted as a courtesy to the presenters. At the end of today's call, there will be a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. Should you wish to ask a question at any point during the webinar, uh, please feel free to do so at the question box pictured at the right, and at the end of the webinar, we will start to run through those questions. If you have any technical issues uh, with the question box, feel free to email us as well. You can email Florina Gobel, you see her email address on the screen, it's florina.gobel, G-O-B-E-L, at csets.com, and we'll be sure to get your questions in the inbox, and after our presenters are done uh, speaking uh, later on today, we'll make sure we address all the questions that come through. So on the call today with us, we're, we're very privileged to have two of the most progressive quality thought leaders in the healthcare space today, share a little bit of insight into how they're approaching some of the more pressing quality improvement uh, initiatives that their healthcare systems are trying to tackle. And on, us, uh, on the call with us today is Dr. Stephen Knick. Dr. Knick is the Vice President and Chief Quality and Patient Safety Officer for Adventist Health System. And we're also joined by Dr. Mark Jarrett. And Dr. Jarrett is the Senior Vice President and Chief Quality Officer for Northwell Health. Before I transition the call to both these gentlemen to speak about the healthcare um, quality improvement initiatives that they're leading across their organizations at scale, I wanted to take just a few minutes to orient the group in, as to how CSAS is helping some of these healthcare systems tackle some very important and pressing quality improvement initiatives. Uh, at a very high level, for those that aren't familiar with CSAS, and it looks like roughly half the call today is, is not, we help healthcare systems reduce variation of care and implement best practice standards. And we do this by combining technology along with validated surgical skill assessment instruments. And we'll speak on the call today uh, as to what that looks like and, and what that means. And we'll have some of our, our healthcare partners at Adventist and Northwell share what some of the results have been with married uh, technology and data uh, into the quality improvement space. But uh, at a high level, you see a quick snapshot of our, of our company on the screen today. We actually started as a research project at the University of Washington roughly five years ago. At that point in time, a group of us got together, data scientists, software engineers, biostatisticians, and surgeons, and asked the question, how can we approach quality improvements, specifically technical skill assessment and technical skill improvements in non-traditional means by using technology and, and non-traditional approaches to try to drive insight into performance improvements and then customize that improvement tailored to the individual's uh, skill level and capabilities of learning. And went through a, a pretty rigorous couple of years of research and validating methodologies. We've been validated and published now in close to 50 peer reviewed abstracts and manuscripts. As that kind of uh, uh, research moved on, we've got some early seed money to start the company. And you can see the progression and, and timeline with um, you know, uh, uh, Venice and Northwell being two of our first larger healthcare system partners that we worked with in the quality improvement space. We'll have both Dr. Kinnick and Dr. Jarrett share some of the work that that we've done within their healthcare systems here in a minute. And you can see as we've, as we've ramped up now, we've done a little over 2 million quality improvement assessments, and we have a bunch of different technologies that we'll talk about today that we're really excited about in the machine learning space, in the video software recognition space. But ultimately, we wanted to create a platform that uh, can uh, surgeons will embrace. It will give them the tools and means to improve their technical proficiency without having to take time away from practice and clinic, and ultimately, the benefits of the healthcare system and the patients our reduction in cost of care and improvement in quality of care. And you see on the, the left-hand side of your screen, as our presenters will share here today, uh, we're starting to see the impact that not only the technical proficiency has on quality outcomes and patient outcomes, but our, our ability to move the needle and improve those metrics when we get surgeons to engage and, and embrace our technology. I'm really excited to have both of our speakers talk about some of that here in a minute later on today. So our, our primary use cases, um, I mentioned we've been published in close to 50 peer review abstracts and manuscripts, uh, but most of the stuff we do is in the operating room. It's, it's a passion of ours. We, we think that's a, a, a space that um, is ripe for this type of technology. Uh, most of the work we do in that space is in the field of surgery, and most of that is in the field of minimally invasive surgery, specifically laparoscopy and robotic surgery. Uh, it's very easy to capture the imaging technologies in those 
uh, and those two modalities. And there's uh, a bunch of validated instruments that have shown construct validity and measuring skill level. And we have built platforms out that can rapidly uh, assess and then provide some feedback to try to improve that skill level over time. So that's where we spend most of our efforts in healthcare today. And so how it works real quick, and then I'll, I'll show a, a couple snapshots of what the data outputs look like, and then I'll step out of the way and, and transition over to Dr. Knick. So when we sign uh, on with a new healthcare system, uh, the first thing we work on is creating a hardware software solution to ingest the media. Typically that's video, and as you see on the left-hand side of your screen, we have a, a, a hardware solution that will record, encrypt, and transfer video files from, uh, in this case, the operating room to us. Uh, once the video file is received by us, uh, we have a process where we marry machine learning, video recognition, and reviewers that tag the video by procedure step, and then we marry the validated instrument to the video, and we break the procedure steps down, and then for every procedure step that's assessed, it's roughly 45 to 50 people, reviewers that are rating the video, we'll speak later on today to, to who these reviewers are, and then in the back end, there's a dashboard that goes back to position uh, with very specific performance improvement recommendations that are customized to the interoperative video analysis that was done uh, through our platform. In total, you can see on your screen what, what those look like, uh, from qualitative uh, feedback from the reviewers to CME curriculum at the bottom. We'll show some examples of all this, but we really wanted to take the interoperative learning opportunities and marry not only a score, but very specific improvement customized solutions for a surgeon based upon that score that they can get engaged on on their mobile device in very uh, bite-sized increments. So uh, quickly on two things of where we like to see this go as it stands today, um, we receive about 450, 450 to 500 data points per procedure step that's assessed through our platform. So that's a tremendous amount of data. Uh, we are, are really trying to look at that data to understand uh, variation at the step level of each procedure of care and then trying to provide actionable feedback to, to reduce variation of care across those. And in order to do that, we've built out a machine learning team. Uh, machines are very good at taking large unstructured data sets and trying to find sentiment in the data and signal in the data. So the first thing we've programmed the machine learning to do is to look at common sentiments and we'll speak to what that, what that is here in a little bit. But for every video that's pushed through, uh, there's about three to four paragraphs of qualitative data on each procedure step, and we're using that data to look for uh, trends and signal, uh, and we're using that trends and signal to reduce variation and drive standardization of training best practices at the procedure step level. Uh, and there's a, there's a lot of kind of interesting work we're doing in the machine learning space. We won't get into a whole lot of it on today's call, but it's helping us make a better sense of, of big data and large data sets. And then the other technology uh, is video recognition software. And uh, this is a really interesting space for us, we're starting to look at the video recognition software to identify a bunch of things, but for every video now that comes uh, into our system, we break it down frame by frame. And by breaking it down frame by frame, we're, start to, we're able to understand for a very specific step of a very specific case, why does someone take 22 minutes to do an anastomosis and someone takes 10? What instrumentation are they using? How are they approaching the anatomy? Uh, and it, it helps us identify other things you can see on the screen now. Uh, the VR platform built out can recognize cautery, they can recognize when gauze is put in the body, it can recognize when the scope is taken out of the body. Uh, this is important because it helps us just black out any PHI that may be collected if the scope is taken out of a body. So we're starting to use VR recognition software in combination with the reviews to get to very specific procedure task oriented things that will help us understand variation uh, of care in a, in a more sophisticated manner and we're really excited about where this is going in, in the future. So without further ado, um, I'm going to step out of the way and allow our, our quality officers to speak to how uh, we have started to implement our technology across their healthcare solution. Our, our first speaker of the day is Dr. Stephen Kinnick. As I mentioned at the start of the call, Dr. Kinnick is the Vice President and Chief Quality and Patient Safety Officer for Adventist Health System. He is a, a fellow and, and, and an orthopedic surgeon. He's, uh, despite his uh, heavy academic uh, an executive schedule at Adventist Health. He still finds time to be an assistant professor at UCF, UCF, UCF College of Medicine. Uh, you can also see there he's the Adventist Health System Corporate Vice President and the Chief Patient Safety and Quality Officer for Adventist Health System. Uh, Dr. Knick has been very gracious with his time to join us here today. He's going to speak to 
uh, how CSAT has been implemented across the Venice Health System, what use cases we've done in the past, and what use cases we're looking going forward. Uh, but before I transition to Dr. Knick, this is a disclaimer for the group here today. Uh, one of the, okay, one of the, and, and both speakers will speak about this, but one of the, the, the ways that we protect the data that we derive through our platform is by working closely with patient safety organizations. And when we do so, there's parameters as to what can and can't be disclosed with that data. So Dr. Knick has been very gracious to share some of the data sets we've been able to drive through a Venice Health System on an aggregate level. Uh, but before he gets into that, I need to remind the group today as to what, uh, what comes, what responsibility comes with sharing that data for the group. So participants on this call cannot disclose the contents of any of the slides from Venice Health System to anyone without express written consent of the HS Quality Circle Patient Safety Organization. Impermissible disclosure could violate the Patient Safety and Quality Act of 2005 and result in legal actions up to and including monetary fines. Dr. Knick, should there be questions on any of the data that he presents, he is happy to address one-off with, um, with the audience uh, outside of the confines of the webinar. So without further ado, Dr. Knick, I'll, I'll transition the, the steering wheel to you, and, and thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much, Sean. I appreciate it, and uh, thank you to our audience who's taken the time to take a look at this. Uh, Adventist Health System is a faith-based organization. Uh, we are headquartered in Altamont Springs. We're rather large now. We have about 45 hospital campuses across nine states, a little over 8,200 licensed beds, more than 5 million patients served, and we have uh, 16 uh, facilities that provide uh, robotic-assisted minimally invasive surgery. The key AHS 2017 strategic initiatives revolve around these three main areas, clinical care transformation, consumer focus, and innovation. And by clinical care transformation, we mean uh, following the lead of Banner and Intermountain Health and many other systems that have begun this work a few years ago, beginning to redesign our systems. Uh, such that uh, we have about 70% uh, standardization of care processes across the continuum of disease conditions and about 30% uh, appropriate variation based on the particular condition of the patient, uh, pro proper things that that patient requires. Consumer focused, meaning that we want to make sure that we're just not organizing our system around ourselves or our providers, but that we're meeting the needs of our consumers and innovation. We have a yearly Innovation X Awards competition. Uh, we actually just traveled uh, to Ireland, Dublin, Ireland recently, as we were asked to come over there and provide an Innovation X experience for Enterprise Ireland. A uh, great group of people and very exciting and wonderful opportunity. We have a design lab that is being finished near our main campus in Altamont Springs, and we have a design lab in place already at our uh, main campus at Florida Hospital Orlando in uh, Orlando, Florida. What you see on the screen now is the guideline for Adventist Health System hospitals that perform robotic-assisted minimally invasive surgery. Uh, we realized back in about 2013 that there is no nationally or internationally recognized uh, single entity uh, like there is with MBSA equip and weight loss surgery for robotic surgery. Uh, many of the subspecialties and specialties in surgery are still wrapping their heads around how to manage and maintain a proper, proper privileging and credentialing in robotic surgery. So I put together a group of 13 surgeons from across our company, led by Dr. Vip Patel, very uh, well-known, internationally known uh, urologic uh, prostate surgeon who does all of his cases robotically. He just completed his 10,000th uh, robotic uh, prostatectomy this, uh, earlier this year. And we wanted to create a guideline for some of our smaller hospitals that were beginning to want to get into this work around robotic surgery. Uh, even hospitals that were uh, 120, 130, 150 beds uh, that really had surgeons that were quite capable and coming to them 
uh, and being able to provide these services, but wanted to make sure that we were doing this in a safe and effective and quality focused way. And when we did this, we created an aspect of this guideline that required a certain amount of robotic specialty specific CMEs of the surgeons. Now, in order to get those, you had to do robotic specialty specific CME activity. And at that time, it was very difficult to do that. So we began looking for providers who could provide CME credits that we considered to be surgical uh, robotic specific. And uh, we found CSATs through uh, uh, University of Washington and our contact uh, in this realm, uh, Dr. Uh, Rick Satava. And we began to explore how the ability to use video assessments of literally the procedures that you are providing to patients could allow us a more robust way of understanding our privileging and credentialing processes for these robotic surgeons, but also uh, allow them even more importantly to continue to improve their skills as well as obtain CMEs at the uh, at their discretion and uh, right from the comfort of their own home uh, based on uh, participating in this program, going back to the assessment page, looking at their assessments, going into the learning tools that are on the page, participating in the learning tools, perhaps even and up to including telementoring, and uh, then claiming CMEs. And that we found that to be a very good and beneficial aspect of this for our surgeons. The CSATS platform that we are looking at uh, exploiting an Adventist health system revolve around laparoscopic surgery, surgical first assistance, and of course robotic surgery as already mentioned, with the goal of reducing variation in skills that will produce a tighter band of excellent clinical outcomes. The surgical first assistant area was explored after we began our work with CSATs when we discovered that in the assessments that were coming back to our surgeons, and I believe other clients that CSAT serves as well, that were mentioning the first assist. And so our surgeons came to us and said, you know, it, it might be reasonable to start looking at developing something that could improve the skills of surgical first assists, who could vary from a fellow uh, to a resident to a literally a professional first assist who, who comes in and does this work for a living. So uh, we thought that that was reasonable and there was a high percentage of comments about that. So we are uh, exploring how we can uh, co-develop an, uh, an educational assessment and improvement opportunity tool in CSATs for uh, surgical first assists. The innovative approaches to continuous performance improvement, as you know, have key success factors. And I know there's been some preliminary questions that have come to us around the quality world saying, how, how do you get people to buy off on this? How do you get your executives to buy off on this? Um, how do you make this stick in your organization or even get people to listen to you in your organization? And so these are the things that we've found to be extremely helpful. The initiative, whatever it happens to be, this case robotic surgery and CSATs, needs to be relevant and aligned to multiple imperatives. We have six major imperatives at Adventist Health System. CSATs aligns to two of those major imperatives. One is mitigate or manage risk, and the second is improve the product. So if you can bring your project, whatever it happens to be, or program CSATs in this case, forward that connects to major imperatives, uh, it's much more likely to be accepted and gain some traction. You have to be able to articulate the goals to all the stakeholders. So what's the goal to your financial-minded uh, people? What's the goal to your operations leaders? What's the goal to your surgeons? You have to be able to articulate these things clearly so everyone sees what's in it for them. You have to be able to design safe, protected learning environments for surgeons. Uh, let's be clear, I'm an orthopedic surgeon by background, and this is very personal. Uh, someone looking under the covers and seeing how I approach a particular surgical site, 
how I perform my actual surgery, how I'm performing anastomoses, and uh, various other aspects, key aspects of my procedure, uh, is pretty personal. Uh, this is my business. This is my life. Um, I'm dedicated to making it better, but when you start pulling back the covers this close to home, uh, it gets personal. So you have to have a safe learning environment to do this work in. That's the patient safety organization, as earlier mentioned. And you have to be able to deliver timely, actionable, confidential performance results to the surgeons. Timely is critical because we know in performance improvement that if it's not timely, it's not going to help you to improve your performance. It has to be actionable. It has to be something that I know I can resonate with and actually have within my control to do. So the comments by the expert reviewers are very, very actionable. The surgeons resonate with them. They find that they can carry them out directly, and it's something that they can say, well, I'm going to try that on my next case, literally, and their next case may be tomorrow morning. So that's the kind of criticality of information that means something to people who are doing the work, and they see value to it. Key findings to date. This is a little bit of a summary uh, of our activity to date. We initially started this work with nine pilot hospitals in seven of our regions across the U.S. We then adopted it fully and deployed it fully into a multi-year program. It was fully adopted and uh, rolled out across our hospitals uh, by the end of March of this year. Uh, and our findings to date are listed there on the slide with over 1,400 hours of surgery uploaded, 42,000 data points, and a look at the CME credits. Again, 605 CME credits claimed and many more earned. And what happens, we found, is the surgeons like to bank their credits. So they like to bank them up to about 20 before they claim them. So some of these are literally in the surgeon's bank, and they can go on the site, claim them at any time, pull them down, and they count for their uh, re-privileging, re-credentialing, and also for their maintenance of certification activities. These are some of the outcomes. So when we began this work with the Robotic Surgeons Task Force, the surgeons identified six outcome measures that they felt would be meaningful to them. This shows you a couple of them. Those six measures are convert to open, estimated blood loss, length of stay, complications related to surgery resulting in readmissions, and return to surgery in the same hospital stay. Now, some of these are binary, meaning they happened or they didn't happen, and you might be able to attribute them to quality, but some of these need to be validated. For instance, the readmissions, they may be readmitted within 30 days for a fractured radius instead of something related to their surgery. You need to review these cases to see what's going on. Convert to open. That may be exactly the right thing to happen, but if you notice a particular trend with a surgeon or two that seems to be having more convert to opens, uh, there may be a learning opportunity there to investigate, but those charts have to be looked at and the surgeon has to be involved in that uh, discussion and, and that evaluation. So just a few examples, but what's really exciting is that if you take a look at these numbers, Pre-CSATS means that we gave to CSATS an entire year of data on these outcomes for all of our robotic surgeons. We have a little over 160 in our company. And we sent the results of these six outcomes pre-CSATS. And then after 10 CSATS assessments. And you can see these are BMI and ASA severity adjusted and procedure specific. And we are starting to see a signal that there is statistically significant improvement in these areas with the feedback and with the assessments that CSATS has given these surgeons because we have not altered anything else in their ecosystem. This is the only intervention that we have done in their ecosystem. Laparoscopic hernia repair and robotics, just another example of some of the excellent statistical work that CSATS and their biostatistician is providing for us as we look at median time reduced in ASA class one and twos versus threes and fours based on the number of CSATS assessments. Re 
readmissions for non-emergency cases, again, showing a trend in ASA Class 1 and Class 2 cases. Not so much a trend yet in ASA 3s and 4s because most of the time those readmissions are coming back in due to other comorbidities and other disease management issues. But at least in this case, some uh, what I'd call uncomplicated or less complicated patient cases uh, are showing some good improvement with uh, avoiding readmissions as your skills increase. And then just a specific surgeon example to show you how you can slice the data. This is a particular surgeon using their inguinal hernia uh, cases and the sequence of uh, inguinal hernia repair CSATS assessments. Uh, the gear scores you can see going up on the left from 18 to a little over 21 over this time period and the surgery time in minutes progressing down consistently again for this particular procedure for this surgeon as they improve their skills and as they use the feedback CSATS provides. Now you might say this might happen anyway over time. Well what's really shocking is that we have seen these types of changes happening in as little as three months. And that's really amazing when you look at the overall skills progression and outcomes impact progression of surgeons using the platform. Finally, uh, the top quartile versus bottom quartile. So if you wanted to make a business case to your hospital as to why this is worthwhile, if you could put in some type of intervention that would make such a difference where your top quartile performers versus your bottom quartile performers are showing a 37% decrease in OR time, a 33% decrease in intraoperative direct costs. And we, these were costs that we actually sent to CSATs that represent our actual costs. These aren't projected or off of any national normalized scale. These are actually our costs from our financial accounting system and a 27% decrease in total procedure cost. Now that usually can get a financial leader fairly excited. Uh, so I think what we're seeing here is some great quality impacts and some great operational impacts and some great financial impacts and I'll, I'll stop there. Great, thank you Dr. Kinnick. Um, I've seen a couple questions come in. Just a quick reminder before we transition to Dr. Jarrett, please feel free to continue to submit your questions in the question chat box off on the right-hand side of the screen on your GoToWebinar drop-down. Uh, we'll address those questions when Dr. Jarrett uh, finishes his portion of the presentation today, but thank you for, for submitting it. So without further ado, I'll transition to Dr. Jarrett. Dr. Jarrett is the Chief Quality Officer for Northwell Health. You see his bio on the screen here today. Uh, shortly after we onboarded Adventist as, as one of our first large healthcare system partners, uh, Northwell was quick to follow. Northwell uh, has a reputation, as you see from Dr. Jarrett's uh, conversation here today, as being very progressive in looking at innovative ways to drive uh, quality care improvements and really looking at data sets that are actionable. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to hearing from Dr. Jarrett. Uh, I'll transition to him. And again, feel free to continue to submit questions via the question box. And when Dr. Jarrett's done, uh, we'll address all questions on the call. So with, with that, uh, Dr. Jarrett, the floor is yours, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much. So uh, quite frankly, I, I almost have little to add after uh, that excellent first talk, So, uh, but I'll kind of give you our experience. Uh, Northwell is a uh, health system that's uh, in Metro New York. We represent about 21 hospitals, spread across about a uh, a large amount of real estate, about 100 uh, or so miles in, uh, in New York, around New York City and, and the environs, Long Island and Westchester. We're about 6,600 licensed beds, and we actively serve uh, touch and take, unique patient touches, about 2 million patients a year. Um, one of our things is we also developed our own medical school about seven years ago, opened it up for the first time. Uh, and as part of our, as, as we talk a little further, our concept of innovation uh, with a very unique uh, medical school curriculum. Uh, so for example, we do not have multiple choice tests. Everything is discussions and essays. And the first nine weeks, the, the first year students spend at the medical school, they actually spend getting trained as EMTs and uh, get state licensed and ride the ambulances. So their first exposure uh, to patients are often in the home or on the street. 
and their first person teaching them is a non-physician. That's kind of how we do things. We now have a graduate school of nursing also that actually does classes with the medical school. Uh, and uh, we have something called Northwell Ventures, which is our arm, which I'm sure Ventus has the same type of thing as many of you do, uh, that's looking to develop uh, outside um, innovative businesses that really don't, that are for healthcare, but they're really joint ventures or investor uh, type things. Okay, next slide. So innovation is important. Uh, a big principle of ours is transparency, and actually I'll address that issue right now. So as we've gone through CSATs, one of the questions I'm sure some of you have is do, do we share people's individual results uh, with uh, other physicians? At this point, for the CSATs, we're not. Uh, most data we do, outcome data we do, uh, but not for the CSATs because we really see that as a, a personal learning experience. And at this point, we felt it would probably be uh, actually a negative thing to do. Uh, however, people see where they sit in terms of quartiles compared to everybody else, and we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, again, as said before, you know, we want actionable, real-time feedback uh, to drive improvement. The whole goal is to have our, uh, uh, our you know, surgeons provide the best possible care. And we needed something that was fairly objective. Uh, as many of you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. Outcome measures are not always the most, the best measures of how people are doing. And uh, even, as I'll show an example, one physician who really had always great outcomes and was respected and was the person people went to uh, for family members with their robotic surgery, uh, when we applied objective data, as you can see on this thing, this person was actually in the bottom quartile. Uh, this physician, the surgeon, looked at it and said, wait a minute, I have great outcomes, but what am I, and paid attention to the techniques that they saw, some of the, you know, the, the visual techniques, review videos, uh, and very, very quickly uh, moved up to the top quartile. So we think it's important that even really good people can get better uh, because we all develop workarounds, we all get a little I don't want to say sloppy, but we get a little bit used to doing things the way we did it. Uh, clearly, we want to look at adverse outcomes. We're looking at uh, um, the same things that Ventus looks at. Uh, so, of course, we want to cut length of time, readmissions, et cetera. So it's the similar uh, types of things. And again, it's giving you data that you can look at. Kevin, the next one? No, you got it up, right? This is the, uh, you know, again, we have others, physicians who went up. So this is what we're using it. All the videos are up loaded and uh, some are assessed, some aren't assessed. If they're not assessed, they're deleted after 45 days. And the only reason we keep it for the 45 days is in case that something goes on later on in the care and we want to look back, was there anything with the surgical technique? So we use it for that feedback loop. Um, initially, everybody gets three videos assessed, assign them to the quartiles. If they're in the top three quartiles, they get randomized sampling of three cases per quarter. Uh, they can ask for more. Uh, if they're in the bottom quartile, every third case is randomly uh, assessed, all right? And we store all of these so we can track them over time. Uh, they're protected again because, uh, and we've worked a lot with our uh, legal department to make sure that this cannot be used again because it's, a, uh, it's not part of the medical record and it's a teaching tool and it's for performance improvement. So in New York State, it is protected. Um, we're also using it for credentialing. Uh, clearly, like many of you, for robotics, we, you may set a cutoff point of, let's say, 20 cases in two years in order to maintain your privileges with good outcomes. What do you do about the person who has 18 or 19? Clearly doesn't mean that they're not as good as somebody who has 21. Statistically, that makes no sense. However, you have to have a cutoff, so then we ask for an increased number of videos to be reviewed over the next year to make sure that they're keeping uh, that their technique is good and they're keeping up with everything the way they should. And it gives you objective data rather than just saying somebody saying, oh, we think they do a good job. Uh, we're expanding this for all of our sites with uh, robotic surgery and eventually to go to all of our laparoscopic surgery as well. We think it's an extremely important tool for GMA. Uh, we're teaching now how staff new techniques. How do we know how good they are and how do we be able to prove that when they leave their residency, that they can be independent, and we're using this as a tool. 
And finally, like Adventist, we're using it for uh, following for recredentialing for FPPE and OPPE. Again, you may have a surgeon who's a robotic surgeon who's got a great reputation, comes in from the out another institution, and is recruited to your site. Do you really know if they're as good as they say they are? This gives you objective data to look at. It's not the end all and above all, but again, matching it with other outcome data and other things that you can measure, such as readmissions, et cetera, it kind of tells you, gives you a more complete picture. And again, it's objective. It's not somebody saying, well, I think they're really a good surgeon. Can I have the next slide? Um, you have to think about how you're going to handle it. Right now, unlike Adventist, we're not in multiple states. And I know Florida has different issues about what's protected and not protected. Uh, but in New York, if it's part of our performance improvement and kept as in the quality assurance package, then we can maintain it and it's privileged and it's not discoverable. The problem is, is what happens if you want to compare yourself to people outside of your state uh, or if you're a health system that has things in multiple states, then probably the thing you really want to go to is towards a patient safety organization uh, because then that's federally protected and in almost all cases, though not every case with every state, it means that what you're doing as part of performance improvement is protected from discoverability, which is a big selling point to the docs because obviously, you know, our surgeons, rightfully so, are concerned. Well, if you have this thing and it shows my technique was off a little bit and then the patient has a problem later on, they'll be able to use that against me. And this is a way of protecting it. That's a very mm -hmm. important buy in by the surgeons. Mm -hmm. Next slide. I think that's it. So I guess we're at the end, as I said, Steve covered a lot of the stuff, so I will. Uh, leave it to you now uh, to see what questions you guys have. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Jarrett, and thank you, Dr. Knick. We've had a, a few questions come in here, so I'll, I'll open it up. And, and uh, Christy, if you can unmute the line for, for Dr. Jarrett and Dr. Knick so they can both uh, give their thoughts. The first question was, is there any particular advice you can provide in implementing across multiple hospitals at the same time? Was a joint pre-meeting necessary or advisable? Well, uh, uh, Dr. Jarrett, if you want to take that first, and then I'll give you our thoughts about it at AHS. Sure. We're just we're just rolling it out. We had piloted in a couple of sites, uh, bigger sites, but we're now rolling out to all of our places that do uh, robotic uh, MIS. And we we did was we had a, meet, a joint meeting of everybody. Uh, had first local meetings to explain, then brought everybody together. It does require a little bit of a sale, but it goes to the fact that. You want to reduce variation, uh, as said before, and this is the standard that we're holding everybody to. In your own system, there should be one standard across it, and that's the way we sold it. And the important thing is, and again, you may want to do this, is pilot it one place first and prove that it's not anything that anybody's going to get really upset with. It's a much easier sale after that uh, to the rest of the sites than trying to just start scratch rolling it out to everybody. I mean, again, some people may be very receptive to that, but I'd be a little cautious with that. Yeah, I would agree with Dr. Jarrett's comments, and, and I would add a couple of other things that uh, uh, we approached it at uh, from Adventist Health System, and that is um, we initially uh, had this piloted for up to about six months at seven of our facilities the willing few, as we call them, right? The early adopters, the willing few. We had conversations with those chief medical officers, those robotic surgeon leaders, and we had a task force document that represented leaders in robotics across all of our institutions that held a lot of weight because these were doctors who were actively practiced, who were very well respected, and they were used as physician champions across our different hospitals and different regions. We then had to expand it because we had a few more hospitals in Florida that uh, were larger, higher volume. They wanted to see how it worked for them. So we expanded it. So we had about nine months of a pilot actually in uh, nine facilities covering seven of our regions. And then what we did was we took it back to the uh, point of results and had a, had a meeting with the task force again, got their impressions, shared the results with them, and then went forward through this document, the robotic surgery document I showed you, and went to 
uh, the 15 hospitals, then subsequently one hospital stood up their entire program based on the document and adopted this CSATS technology as well. But we left it up to each individual medical executive committee at each hospital uh, so that they could uh, digest this and adopt this um, and sanction it as a self-governing medical staff uh, uh, should and can do. And uh, so that's how we, we walked it through. So it took us 45 hospitals, you know, 16 hospitals in, involved in this. We gave our facilities uh, a year and a half to adopt this uh, program after the, um, after the initial uh, document was released. And then uh, we gave them another three months or so after the pilot phase was done to um, embed this in their facilities um, as well. So this was not a short journey for us. Uh, I think our overall journey was about two years from idea to uh, full execution. Great. Thank you, Dr. Connect and Dr. Jarrett. Uh, the next question that came in, uh, has this technology been utilized in any non-robotic camera procedures, i.e. arthroscopy? Is there a plan to begin this evaluation if the answer is no? Uh, I can address that and then feel free, um, Dr. Jarrett and Dr. Connect to chime in as well. The answer to that is yes. Um, about 40% of the stuff we do today is actually in laparoscopy. The other, the other majority is robotic surgery. We have done open surgery and we've done a bunch of non-surgical use cases as well. Uh, in the, we've done a couple arthroscopy studies specifically to the person that asked this question and we have a couple large orthopedic projects that we're looking to get underway and evaluating total knee, total hip. And we've even asked to do crazy stuff outside of surgery like uh, with Starbucks to evaluate their baristas. It's not very uh, interesting work for us to do right now, so we're continuing to focus this in healthcare, uh, but we have done a bunch of stuff outside of robotics as well. Uh, I, I can move to the next question, or if there's anything you want to add to that, Dr. Jarrett, Dr. Connick, feel free to, to weigh in. No, nothing right. from my end. Uh, uh, next question came across. Um, I could see uh, Sean? how- uh, yes, Sean? Yeah, I'd like to, to add one piece to that, and um, I think this is important, and I think Dr. Jarrett would agree. Um, I think the validity of the use cases that we've seen with CSATs and that we've been able to um, encourage our surgeons to adopt and, and be as successful as we are is that in robotic surgery, the GEARS tool is validated, it's accepted, it's understood, the surgeons didn't ask a lot of questions about it. It's been tested and true, it's been researched. Furthermore, the GOALS tool in laparoscopic surgery is again uh, another tried and tested validated tool. So the, um, the litmus test that we have given to using CSATs in different use cases at Adventist Health System has initially been led by uh, the fact that uh, this assessment has a standardized process. There is good inter-rater inter reliability that the CSATs folks monitor and maintain. There is expert opinion that's involved in this, so both qualitative and quantitative feedback and the learning tools to affect your behavior should you need them. And then the validated assessment tool piece uh, is there. Uh, I think you have to show surgeons, professionals of any kind, that you have a valid way of assessing them and it's consistent and standard across the board. You're measuring everyone with the same thermometer, if you will, or same yardstick, and you're not doing metrics and uh, English system and, and really confusing people. Uh, those points were very important to us. I don't know, Dr. Jarrett, if you, if your docs had any questions about the tool or how they're assessed or if that played a role at all. No, I mean, they were concerned. I mean, I think they had the same questions that you, you I mean, I think people are the same all over. They had the same questions. They were really concerned about the validity of the tool and, you know, and all that. And I think, again, the most important thing is that they have to recognize that, and we said, it's a tool for improvement, but it's not, you know, it's not like the final grade on a report card that's going to judge whether you're, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. We'll do it and interpret it. And fortunately, when you start looking at a lot of other data uh, associated with this, you showed that the people who don't score well are often the people who have outcomes data that isn't the best either. So it makes it very easy once you pilot it and shown that 
that it you know that people will then buy in. Great. Uh, the next question that came in was was largely centered around um, gaining uh, surgeon buy-in uh, for these programs across all spectrums. And the, the, the question was basically that you could see how higher performing, better outcome surgeons would embrace this technology. What were the keys within your healthcare systems to get all surgeons to feel comfortable embracing this program and embracing this technology? You know, I'll start. Again, it's a matter of talking to them, explaining to them what you're doing, getting their feedback on it. So, you know, after they get their first one or two cases back, so what'd you think of it? Well, you know, what would you like better? What would you like us to do? Uh, and, you know, I think there's always this urban myth, uh, especially about surgeons, and although I'm not a surgeon, my daughter is, so I can speak for it, that they, you know, that all surgeons, you know, are, you know, that not everybody's you know, going to be resistant to these things. Uh, I think 99% of people want to do the right thing all the time by their patients. And even though they may think they're doing the best job, I think if you give them data, almost everybody goes and says, you know what, I can improve and do better. And, uh, you know, I've always been very positively, uh, you know, surprised how well things go when you think that it's going to be a harder sell than it is. I mean, the most important thing is that they feel you're not using it against them, but using it for performance improvement. I would agree with Dr. Jarrett on that, and I would say that especially as Dr. Jarrett mentioned a bit in the state of Florida, where we have 23 of our hospitals, um, it it is a very uh, uh, difficult uh, legal environment, and um, we had to create a very safe learning environment uh, that is safe from discovery for our surgeons to do this and continue to participate. Our program is entirely voluntary. Um, at, uh, and during our uh, pilot period, we had 81% voluntary participation. So the surgeons, to Dr. Jarrett's point, when they realize that this is protected, their dashboard only goes to them. They are the only ones that see it. They can interact with it. They can interact with the education and training. They get it on their mobile devices. They can really uh, personalize their continuing performance improvement journey and get CMEs sitting at their own home without having to travel to a course where they get just your basic overview or your master's overview, but it's still sort of the, the splat theory. Here, surgeons can actually see their own cases, the assessment of their own cases, the expert opinions, and then go into the best case videos and best case scenarios and uh, see how other surgeons are doing different parts of the procedure that they do and then if they even want get telementoring by an expert to go over side by side, this is what I do in this case, this is what I don't do in this case. I saw you did this, sometimes this works better. I hold the mesh at six o'clock, you held it at nine o'clock. I mean, these things matter a lot to surgeons and so we found very good voluntary adoption and our program actually allows the surgeons to even select which cases they submit because we wanted to go into a very benign learning environment mode, submit your best cases and let's see what it looks like. And so you, the case information you're seeing are volunteer surgeons who are submitting what they uh, feel safe submitting. This is a case that went well, let me submit it. And you're still seeing improvement um, in that uh, scenario, which is really remarkable. Great. Uh, the next question that came in was uh, tailored back to one of Dr. Kinnick's slides on the hernia uh, OR time improvement. And the question was, were you able to control for experience in your uh, assessment of improvement? Uh, and I, the, the question cut off after that, but basically I think they're asking Dr. Kinnick, is, um, as you looked at the, the time improvement, was there any difference in the experience of the surgeon? Were they all early in the learning curve or were they established practice surgeons at, or was it a mix of everything? Yeah, that's a good question, and it, it was a mix of everything. We didn't specifically segregate the information based on years of experience or number of cases that the robotic surgeon had. Um, and to that point, in our pilot study, we saw that surgeons in every quartile, 
low quartile or high quartile. I think Dr. Jarrett mentioned this as well. Good guys still get even better. Um, we saw movement in all the quartiles. So bottom quartile guys went up to the next quartile. The next went up to the next. 75th went up to the 90th. Uh, so there was movement in all quartiles. This is not just a tool that can make lower performing surgeons better. This in our hands, we found it to be a tool that can make everyone better uh, depending upon your participation. We also looked at non-engaged surgeons. So if you simply send in videos but that you never engage with the platform, you never went back to look at your assessments, you never did anything, you just kind of said, okay, I'll send in a video to get them off my back. Um, those surgeons did not move. Those surgeons did not move in their quartiles over the same period of time that surgeons who submitted and engaged in the platform did move. Uh, now, Dr. Jarrett, like you said, when you take information like that to people, um, it's pretty hard to refute. Right. Thank you, Dr. Kinnick. Um, I'll, I'll, we have a, a series of more questions that came in. I'll take three more, and then for, uh, for sake of time for the presenters, we'll end here in six minutes. And if there's other questions that we don't get to, we'll make sure we follow up with those folks directly through Dr. Chair or Dr. Kinnick. Uh, the next question that came in was, is CME built into the CSATS platform, or must that be granted by the hospital system? Uh, I'll address that one quickly. It's built into the platform. There's no additional cost associated with it. and uh, Surgeons get up to 20 Category 1 CME credits per quarter for up to 80 per year uh, through the platform. The, the next question that came in was, how many complications uh, prevented or length of stay decrease does it take to make CSATs a cost-effective quality improvement solution across the healthcare system? Would you like to take that, Dr. Jarrett, or would you like me to start? I'll, I'll let you to start on that one. Uh, I'm pondering okay. how to <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, um, we, uh, all organizations, are very financially focused and very uh, cost conscious. And so we had to look very carefully at this information and um, had to look at the numbers and understand what the um, uh, possible return on investment would look like. And without uh, giving you any specific numbers, um, what we found, even in looking at just the change in OR time, that one gear's point, an, imp an improvement in one gear's point aggregate score from 18 to 19, 19 to 20, whatever it happens to be, an aggregate improvement in one gear's point equaled up to uh, 22, I can't remember, Sean, 20 or 22 minutes less time in the operating room. If you do that over five cases or four cases, you've got another case that can go into that operating room. So we actually did do the math using our own numbers and our direct costs and our total uh, costs and found it to be substantially uh, viable from a financial uh, viewpoint in hard green dollars, not uh, soft green dollars. This is Mark. I mean, we look, we look you know, we, we don't have it everywhere, but we kind of, you know, so I haven't got great aggregate numbers, but we're seeing similar trends. Probably more importantly is the fact that I think we're starting to see better outcomes and less complications. And you know what? There comes a point in time when you have to invest not only on the ROI, which is important and we're just as financially driven as everybody else is. Uh, but it also gets to the principle of how you objectively measuring how people do. And sometimes you have to invest a little bit to prove it because we all know that that's something we should be doing uh, for the sake of our patients. Right. And I'll, a final question of the session, and then again, for, for those that we didn't get to, I, I apologize. We'll make sure we follow up with the information you've asked uh, afterwards. Uh, how challenging were the IT security and HIPAA issues to overcome within your healthcare systems? Well, we always blame everything on IT, so that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, I mean, there were issues. I mean, you know, it, you know, every, it's like everything else. It told you the IT had some issues. Um, you know, the legal people had issues. Compliance had issues. It, 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 it's like anything else, a major project that, you know, takes a little bit of work. But none of them are insurmountable. They're the usual things when you try and do anything new in any health system or any hospital. I, I don't think that there were any there, – there, there's no deal breakers amongst them. Yeah, I agree with you, Dr. Jared. And uh, our our system has gone to a high-trust environment. So when we first started this journey, uh, CSAF had to submit an ATR, Application Technical Review. It's a multiple-page document that uh, CSAF can give you um, excruciating detail on. But um, beyond that, they then went to a high-trust environment. So CSATS has been an incredibly effective technical partner to work with to be able to meet those requirements in an effective time frame. And also the uh, data security officer has to sign off, make sure all your communication nodes are, are HIPAA secure, et cetera, et cetera. Although we don't transmit any HIPAA-sensitive information over this uh, pathway, we don't have patient names associated with the the videos that go out and things like that, they're all de-identified just to surgeon and date. Um, and then they have, uh, CSATs for us had to take the additional step of completing uh, patient safety organization training, uh, which they gladly did. And uh, they are now, I don't know if you are yet, Sean, or you're completing your uh, federal certification as a patient safety organization yourself. So um, they've done everything that they need to and, and the system has, um, our system responded very effectively to them. Each facility had to do some things with drops and, and stuff like that to make sure where the devices were going was effective. But nothing unusual, as Dr. Jarrett said, typical stuff that they do and nothing that they had any serious heartburn over. Great. Well, on, on that note, I want to, um, I know we're coming up on the hour here, I want to thank Dr. Nick and Dr. Jared again for your, for your time, for being very open and transparent with your thoughts, and, and most importantly, for us to see that and, and being a great partner and giving us the opportunity to support you and the important quality work you're trying to do in advanced patient care. And for those who took the time to join us today, thank you for your curiosity in this work. If there's things that we haven't got to, you have our, our contact information. We'd be happy to follow up. Uh, but thank you, gentlemen, again, and everyone have a great weekend. Look forward to talking again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.